Hello, and welcome to the AWS Research IT Training Series. I'm Marcy Collinson, your session correspondent and the Senior Scientific Research Programs Manager for the AWS Research Team. Today, we are delighted to have two presenters here to discuss Ronin, Research Computing in the Cloud. Our first presenter will be Nathan Albrighton, Chief Executive Officer and Co-Founder of Ronin, followed by Dr. Tara Mabiesta, Principal Research Scientist at AWS. We will reserve the last five to 10 minutes of the session for a Q&A portion, but please feel free to place any questions that you may have during the presentation in the questions queue in the GoToWebinar toolbar, and Don Hancock, co-founder of Ronin, will answer them in real time or we will read them aloud later on. So without further ado, I'll pass the microphone over to Nathan. Nathan, please take it away. Okay, great. Thanks, Marcy. Um, and thanks, thanks everyone for uh, for attending uh, this morning's presentation. Uh, my name is Nathan Albright and I am uh, founder of a product called Ronin. Uh, to give you guys a little bit of a background on myself before we get started, uh, I used to work, or I, I close to four years ago now, was working for Australia's National Science Organisation. And uh, my job there was to help provision infrastructure storage for, for researchers. And we had, uh, you know, we had a good two and a half thousand researchers doing all types of, of research, research um, in just about every field from radio telescopes all the way down to uh, microbiology and all, all those types of things. And uh, what really led me to the cloud was, was the demand of those researchers in those different fields. Now, I'm really uh, excited to show you guys what we come up with in the gap or the four years in between. Uh, and what I'll do is I'll get started with our presentation. I'll just get my screen back. Now, uh, as a little bit more of that, that background, uh, for those on this call, you're most likely familiar with the AWS dashboard, or you've had a quick look at it. Uh, you've, you've logged in, you've run a few things. Now, even as an IT person, when I first logged into the AWS dashboard, this, this amount of choice, the, the pace that Amazon innovates at and brings new services to, to market is, is astonishing. There's, there's a crazy amount of power hidden inside this list that just keeps growing. And what we saw uh, in the research organizations I've worked in was that this learning curve is a really steep one. Uh, it's one that great power lies within these services, uh, but there is so much to learn, so much to, to get a handle on and to, to configure to actually get back to the point of why you logged into the, the AWS dashboard to start with. And that's, that's the research. Uh, we also saw from the other side of the fence, uh, for organizations to provide cloud to, your, to their researchers, uh, this became a very uh, a wide and sprawling amount of options and things that needed to be uh, controlled for an organization uh, to, to make sure that data sets weren't accidentally made public, to, to make sure that the security of everything that was happening in your organization was, was kept secure and you were, you were safely using the, the power of the cloud here. So, so what we did is we come up with a web application we call Ronin. It's an orchestration engine that lives inside your account, inside your AWS account. And uh, what it does is it makes the, uh, or it takes the focus off the actual tools a little bit in that you spend a lot less time learning about the cloud. It puts a lot more focus back on the research. So unlocking that power, making sure that that's an easy thing to understand, make sure it's an easy thing to control so that you can take that power and you can push it right to the edge and, and answer some of the big questions in research. Um, with Amazon Scale, uh, this is so perfectly suited for, for research as well, uh, because before you start or before you run your code uh, on the problem you're trying to solve, uh, it's, it's almost impossible to guess how much infrastructure you might need to process the data set you might not have created yet in the pipeline that's still forming. Uh, with Amazon Scale here, you can actually take your research and have the compute fit the problem you're trying to solve. And it's uh, because it's a cloud service, because it's pay by the minute, you can almost, it, it becomes like Uber for supercomputers. You can rent a massive HPC cluster that you can create 
and then just pay for it by the minute. Uh, and you, you can really get a lot done with this, this type of power. So I'm going to touch on a few things here and I'm going to launch a research environment, uh, one that a lot of people will be familiar with on the call as well. So uh, when you log into Ronan, what you get is a top-down view of all of the projects you have access to. So we took a project-centric approach so that we could uh, manage budgets and manage grants and manage access and security all together in, in the platform in a really easy to understand way. So it, for my example today, I'm going to jump into my Mars project. And what we see first up is a top-down view of everything that's happening in the Mars project right now. Now, I'll, I'll talk about cost a lot uh, as I go through this, because uh, when we were, were meeting researchers and uh, meeting research institutions, universities, um, even commercial customers as well, one of the primary concerns of uh, moving to the cloud was how to manage cost, how to submit you know, a sensible costing for an approval for your grant. Uh, and, and then on top of this, once you've got your grant money or your, or your research funding, making sure you control it and make sure that you get the absolute most you can out of it. So at the very top of the screen, we've got our budget for our Mars project. You can see here, I've got $15,100. I've got $9 remaining of that budget. I've got one machine running. I've got zero cluster nodes running. It's costing me five cents an hour to run the one machine I have at the moment. I can see my storage is rounded up and I've got a price on all of these things as well. So I can quickly get a view of exactly how my Mars project is tracking, how much I'm spending right now, how much I've spent. So with this info, I can actually take the, the tools that Amazon or uh, the infrastructure that Amazon offer and I can push this right to the edge. If, I, if I've got $9 remaining, I'll be able to get $9 worth of value out of that or more. So in this, uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll show you what it's like to actually launch a research environment and get all the way to the point of, say, running your code. Now in this, on the left-hand side, you'll see we have our dashboard. Uh, we have our machines, so single machines, our auto-scaling clusters, our storage, our backups, our object storage. Now in Ronin, we've listened to our, our customers a lot on this, and we've tried to make sure that all of the uh, terminology in the, in the system here is easy to understand. Uh, we wanted to make sure that this was as smooth a process as possible so that you can get back to focusing on the actual research uh, that, that you're planning to do in the cloud. So up here, uh, we have our machines, and if I click on the new machine, we get the Ronin, give me a moment. We get the Ronin machine composer. Now, what we tried to do here was, was emulate a shopping cart experience. Uh, it was something familiar, something that was easy to understand. Uh, as you go through the steps, you select the things you want. Uh, in the right hand side, your build starts to configure or your shopping cart. And at the end you hit launch and we take care of all of the machine parts to actually linking together what you ask for. So at the top, we've got our operating systems. So these will be the latest and greatest that Amazon support with the security patching and all that type of stuff. And down below this, we actually have a pre-configured software stack. Uh, and this is a service catalog. So if you're on this call today because uh, you're looking for ways to, pres uh, to provide Ronin to your researchers, uh, we actually have a way for you to publish as an admin, a service catalog of software tools. So if you can configure it on an operating system, you publish it here as a site-wide uh, consumable or as a project level consumable. And we also go all the way to HPC package management, which we've got a HPC service catalog here as well. And Tara will touch on a few of our HPC tools uh, a little bit later. So what I'll do is, from a researcher point of view, show you what it's like to use. Uh, for my example today, I'm going to use RStudio because it's, it's prevalent throughout the, the research uh, the sector and we, we, we make sure it's, it's so common uh, and it's so heavily used, we, we actually include it in every build of Ronin. So we've got our RStudio image and this one's going to be running on Ubuntu. When I go across to the second tab, the address, 
Uh, Ronan stops me from having to become a network engineer to build and make my machine contactable, secure, without, um, without having to go through that learning curve. So in here, if I just go RST, Ronan will check to see if rst.ronan.cloud is available and it will do all of the machine addressing for me, all of the networking. Now in here, you'll see I didn't get any ports, firewalls, uh, rules, any of that sort of stuff. That's decided by my security team uh, or by my research team up front when you build your Ronin. So we say for this, this build that we're looking at right now, port 22 is the only port that we open for Linux machines. We're going with, uh, you know, internet best practice, public private key, encrypted traffic. That's all that that machine will communicate on. Uh, we've been able to address our machine with rst.ronin.cloud. And if I move to the third tab, we've got the machine type. Now in here, we can take advantage of Amazon's uh, scale and uh, just the sheer number of options, which are really well suited for research again. Uh, in here, there's over 300 different server types and configurations. You've got different chips, different RAM, different configurations of the two. GPUs, storage, uh, locally attached storage, NVMe disk, all of this type of stuff. And you can, if you get your selection wrong, you can change your mind and change it again in about five minutes end to end and, and run your, your code again. So it's such a great uh, platform for research. Uh, I've, seen, I've seen too many examples of uh, procurement where you've had to guess something and you're stuck with a fixed machine. The cloud is great for learning as you go, running your code and doing it in a very cheap way. So for this example, uh, what I'll do is I'll get a, a memory heavy machine and we'll grab a machine here with 32 CPU and uh, a quarter of a terabyte of RAM. You'll see on the right hand side, like a shopping cart, my, uh, my build is uh, being configured for me. When it comes to storage, we can also uh, treat this like we're shopping for hard drives uh, and in a, in a simple fashion, just get enough to place my files write my results. And in this case here, 100 gig of SSD I can see is $12 a month. So very cheap for what I'm doing. You can see on the right hand side, my shopping cart is, is filled up with a, uh, enough to build a machine now. You can see it's $2.57 an hour for the configuration I've asked for. And if I hit launch, Ronan helps me with my access to this machine as well. So I mentioned before, this machine's only open on port 22 with public private key authentication. Uh, and what I've done is I've downloaded a key previously onto my desktop here. And what I can do is just select that key or I can create a brand new key. So I'm logging into this presentation from Sydney. So it's or from Sydney time zone. Uh, so it's, it's late here. Now that will download my private key and it, it essentially uh, sets my lock and key combo for this machine. I've got my key selected now. And if I hit launch my machine, that's all there is to building a pre-configured RStudio image on a quarter of a terabyte of RAM machine with 32 CPUs with hundred gig of SSD attached with Split Horizon DNS taken care of, my subnets, my ports, everything that I needed, I would have needed to learn to deliver this in the native dashboard was all kind of done for me in the background. And if I show me, or if I click show me my new machine, we'll see all of the machines that are built inside the Mars project. Now in here, we've got uh, if you're familiar with the AWS uh, dashboard or the native tools, we've, we've rounded up about eight to 10 screens worth of information here. Uh, what we've got here is networking information, uh, user information. We've got the specification, uh, the specs of the machine. We've got the storage that's attached, how it's attached, all of that type of stuff is here. Now, again, one of the things that keeps coming up for, for uh, building and using cloud in an efficient way is making sure you're cost effective with what you do. So if I click the monthly tab up here, it'll show me the monthly cost across all of the infrastructure I've configured so far in the Mars project. Now, we actually have universities and research organizations now that build their infrastructure and take a screenshot of this and submit it as a grant proposal because we, we've got a really easy way for you to actually calculate uh, what your infrastructure is going to cost for your, 
uh, for your project. You'll also see on this tab, we've got lots of helpful su uh, suggestions. And we've got lots of tools that we've built so that you get advanced level benefits out of Ronin uh, without having to do the advanced level course in uh, cloud computing or networking or security. So in here, what we've got is my RStudio machine. And down the bottom here, it says, make this machine much cheaper than it's going to be. So it's $1,800 per month if I leave it running 24 seven. If I click this button, I get the Ronin smart schedule. Now in the Ronin Smart Schedule, we've got at the very top, we've got uh, templates. So uh, common templates for, for different types of work, uh, work patterns. And below this, we've got a few calculations and a few more tools for tuning it uh, right into to your, your needs. So for this machine, if I was to click the nine to five, our all business template, every day, at 9 a.m. this machine will start and at every day at 5 p.m. this machine will shut down and that will save me on the infrastructure quite a bit. So you'll see here that just went from an $1,800 per month machine to a $600 per month machine. If we tune that further and say, look, I don't plan on doing any, any work on this machine on the weekends and Mondays I'm mostly playing catch up with my inbox. We, we now have a $355 per month machine. Now, if I only had a $5,000 grant, I might not have clicked on an $1,800 machine. But in this, we can actually take that all the way down and I might be able to now afford three of these machines for my devs for, you know, for a month in here. And we can all have very large machines and get a lot more done. If we hit save changes as well, all of those costs are reflected on the cards and you can configure different schedules, individual schedules for individual machines and make this fit and have these guardrails up for exactly how you work in the cloud, how your research works. Now on the end, we actually have a bunch of tools for actually living with this machine. So making it easier to actually live day to day with the, the machine you've created. We've got our check networking package machine uh, which is actually packaging and imaging your machine for reuse in your project. So cloning your research environment, which is, is really important to be able to reproduce the clever things you do. Uh, yeah, managing your backups, managing your storage. And again, there's the smart schedule. And then there's also the terminate your machine. So cleaning up what you're finished with. Uh, we really don't want research funding or uh, university funding to, to be lost to machines that were uh, left there and should have been cleaned up, but we ended up paying for them anyway. So this is a great way to clean up, say, the 11 pieces that go into making that machine so they don't cost you any money. Now, uh, I've talked about security and I've talked about building this machine on, on best practice uh, in a really simple way. Now, normally when you make a machine really secure or, uh, you know, say only on port 22 and only by a public private key, this makes the machine hard to use or uh, can be hard to use if you're not used to a lot of the commands that are required to get on there. Uh, we noticed this with our customers and we ended up building a desktop application for Mac, Linux and Windows that we called Ronanlink. So you'll see a button at the top here. And if you click open with Ronanlink, uh, what will happen is it will launch the Ronanlink application on my desktop and it will create me a desktop management card. If I just bring them both together, You'll see here, I now have an rst.ronan.cloud card for managing this server. You'll see that I used my late PEM key. It's only on port 22 that we're accessing this machine. And if I click connect to machine, I'll get a bunch of options for different ways to interact with this machine. If I jump into a terminal, I can actually uh, mess with the storage. This used my public private key to create a, an encrypted um, uh, tunnel to, to connect to it. So in here, if I just check the storage is right, we can use this and we can install binaries. We can consume this as more of like a, a, a platform as a service instead of software as a service. Now, if we wanted to, if we were just focused on the R Studio application that we built, we can actually consume it that way too. So if I go to connect to machine again, and I scroll down a little bit further, you'll see RStudio is so popular, so is uh, Jupyter Notebooks, that we've included them in our tools as defaults, so that when I uh, 
fire up my R Studio machine, I can actually click Link. Ronin Link will create an encrypted port tunnel to that machine, and it will map those R Studio tools to my next two Chrome tabs. So on this machine here, we've got Shiny Server, and we've also got R Studio. Uh, I'll just sign in. Chrome will tell me my password's no good, but it doesn't realize that I had to have a public-private key relationship with this machine before I could even reach that password. So in any moment, just long enough to make a, a demo awkward, we'll get our R Studio IDE. So in here, um, it, I often in our presentations just mention that it's good to think that you know this Chrome tab here has a quarter of a terabyte of RAM on it. So if you've outgrown your laptop or if you've kicked off a job and it says three years to completion, this is a great way to grab that research, push it into the cloud, take a research tool like our studio or a Jupyter Notebook and then take exactly what you were doing on your laptop or your desktop and push that into the cloud in a much bigger way. Get those jobs done in, in a much quicker way as well. And when we're done with our RStudio machine, we can actually just remove the port and the relationship is now broken in the background and that RStudio machine is no longer listening here. So that's a way to secure your machine again. Now, on this, uh, I thought I'd touch on just a couple of extra bits. Uh, so on this extra tab here, you can actually see your schedule. You can actually check to see when that machine is scheduled to stop or to start again. And you can edit this as well. So if you've got long running jobs, you can actually grab them and, and you can make sure that that schedule doesn't interrupt what you're doing. Now, what I'll do now is I'll switch gears a little bit and I'll switch over to what it's like to administer a Ronin application for a university or for a research project. Now in here, I'll touch on a couple of our admin tools. Uh, up the top, if I jump into my admin tools, I'll see I've got a, a bunch of tools to actually help administer uh, tens or hundreds of projects all running at once with thousands of users, self-serving research, just like I showed you here. Uh, we have our machine list, which gives you a summary of all of the machines that are running. In, in the platform. So like to, a top-down view of what machines are running, what size they are, who's running them, in what project, how much they cost, how much the organization is spending right now. Uh, on that as well, if you're running hundreds of projects with budgets all allocated and set in Ronin, we are tracking every single project for every single cent to make sure your organization is on track for what it plans to spend in the cloud. Now you see here, this is our top-down view of, this is over a hundred projects in this dev environment I have here. You can see here, I have the project owners on the right-hand side. I've got an ability to pause or restart a project just in case the spend is spiraling out of control or there's another issue we need to address or a project's ended and we need to just shut the project down. But we can see here quickly, to the cent, how much is remaining in each project. Um, we can see what their, what their planned budget was. We can see the project owners, and we do have some controls on this as well. We can filter by billing orders or uh, grant codes, and we can quickly see and chop this data up to make sure that we, we've got a good handle on everything that's happening in the AWS platform uh, and that's happening across all of our projects. Uh, in here, we also have our service catalog. So this is where, as an administrator, you can publish things like our R Studio image. You can publish things like Docker, uh, uh, any other software stacks that are requested by your researchers or uh, your team. You can actually build it once in here, configure it for reuse, and publish it so it becomes a consumable in just as many steps as I showed you before. With, uh, as soon as you configure that software, you can make it a, a consumable item. We've also got our user uh, administration, all that type of stuff is here as well. And we just wanted to make sure that with a self-serve service platform here, with as much research as we can possibly be getting done, uh, that everything was under control from an organization point of view, a security point of view, uh, and 
uh, like for a researcher, it's a seamless uh, experience for focus on your research, making sure you just got the tools, you've got the power to answer those questions that, we're, that uh, AWS is so good at doing. So uh, what I'll do is I'll just quickly touch on our architecture document and I'll just show you what it looks like from the top down inside your account. Now, if I scroll down a little bit, we have, as I mentioned before, Ronin is not software as a service. This means we can be deployed in more organizations, in more universities around the world. We can be certified to different levels of security, uh, things like HIPAA, uh, uh, things like uh, I can see in the questions here, NIST guidelines, uh, by being a deployable software stack inside your Ronin environment, we inherit your security posture. We can be audited, we can be certified for your use, depending on what type of workloads you're trying to do. So this, uh, this type of model means that we can be deployed in many more places. The other thing to know about our tool set as well is we only do AWS best practice when we deploy any of your resources. So underneath all of your AWS EC2 instances, all of your S3 buckets, they all look like AWS best practice uh, resources. So that if you need to transfer them to another account that doesn't have Ronin, or you need to turn Ronin off, everything is manageable and is in place uh, in exactly how you might expect. So if you've got support with um, uh, ProServe or, or any other type of AWS support, they will all be able to see and help with configuration that's happening in the background. The last thing I'll touch on, actually the last two things, is we do multi-organization, uh, multi-account deployments as well, because we know I have a, I have a, a good handle and a, a good history in research computing, that the supercomputer part is the easy part if you compare that to trying to transfer your funding from your grant to, to another, say, grant or project. That's often the most complicated thing you'll have to deal with. So what we've actually been able to do is deploy it in multi-accounts and they, everyone in these accounts gets the same security level um, uh, applied or can get the same security level applied. You can do tighter for different uh, configurations as well. But you can also have distributed billing so that different departments can actually uh, receive their AWS bill directly. So if you don't want to manage your costs centrally, we've got the ability here for that. And the other thing with our best practice uh, hat on, uh, I can hand on heart say that the Ronin deployments that we put out and the, and the Ronin instances and uh, you know HPC environments, the buckets, all of the resources we deploy into your AWS account are compatible with everything else AWS does. And I can say that because we, we stuck to the greatest hits and we put them in, in best practice. So if you've got a data lake you plan to expose, if you've got a large data set in an S3 bucket already, we can help you expose that at a machine level, at a project level or organization wide. And we can help you do that uh, uh, as well as part of our configuration and our build. Now, uh, I'll get on to the very last thing before I hand over to, to Tara, and she will give you a proper researcher's uh, view of Ronan. We are actually running a program right now uh, on our blog. So if you head to blog.ronan.cloud, at the very top, we actually have our Ronan research grants. Now we have a million dollars worth of Ronan software up for grabs uh, for research projects. And all you have to do is apply in here uh, put in your uh, your best application for this grant. We'll be able to assess it, and then we'll get back to you and see if we can get a Ronin where you're doing your research as, as soon as quickly and as cheaply as possible. So with all of that uh, out of the way, I'll hand over to Tara, and she'll show you what uh, a proper researcher view of, of Ronin and its tools. Center. Okay, thanks very much. Yeah, let's see. Okay, I think you can see my screen now. So thanks, Nathan. Yeah. 
Um, so uh, while I linger on this project dashboard for a neuroimaging lab, I'll just say a little bit about my background. Um, as Nathan uh, introduced, I was a researcher for 10 years, a professor at the University of Washington. And um, uh, during that time, uh, I was doing neuroimaging research. That is a rather computational type of field. And so we had needs for computers that uh, were different from what the department or what the central condo cluster could provide. So we ended up building a fair number of computers ourselves and, and putting that into our own sort of condo cluster environment. And that was fairly effective, except for the fact that we ran into problems. Um, and uh, the, the problems were largely dealing with the software and the maintenance of things. So uh, when we were sharing a whole bunch of resources the issue was that uh, when you, we were trying to upgrade our software um, to use the latest, greatest versions of our, of our research software, um, we had to sort of negotiate that across all of the researchers. And some people wanted to stay on the same version so they could continue to do their uh, papers and get that publication out, get that grant proposal out. Um, others wanted the latest, greatest thing. And, and this is sort of a management nightmare that I think every researcher is familiar with. Um, there are technical ways to solve this. You could think about containerizing all of your workflows. You could think about going to some sort of module system, but all of that required a huge amount of IT overhead that we just didn't have. And, and to become the IT people to manage that was something we just didn't want to do. We just wanted to kind of do our research and be done with it. We also had a problem that we had over-provisioned because we needed as much memory, as much compute as we needed for the bursty times. But we didn't often use that. And then when we did burst, we didn't have enough. We didn't have GPUs because that was coming up and that the GPUs were used to process a lot of the compute intensive work. We didn't have those. And, and so we sort of suffered a bit waiting for things to complete that could have been a lot faster. Um, so so at somewhere along that time, I thought to myself, AWS, they have all of these resources. It's a pay-as-you-go model. This could work for it. We can save those machines and, and save the versions of the software that we're using and then call that up later, when a year later, when the paper review comes back and I have to do some new analysis. Um, and I started looking into that, and that was really an exciting prospect, except for the problem at the time that managing a budget, managing a lab, actually, was, was too difficult um, in the console. And that was just a whole new slew of IT skills that we would have had to, uh, to take on and, and couldn't do that. So when I moved to AWS, I discovered Ronin and, and realized that this is, this is exactly what I would have loved to have empowered me in my former lab. And so I'm very excited to talk about how a lab might work with Ronin um, to conduct their research and really benefit from the from the things that AWS gives. So um, this is this is a sort of a lab that I've been putting together to demo these kinds of, of features. And um, Nathan talked about the project abstraction, and, and that is the abstraction that could fit in a researcher model. It could be a grant proposal that you're working on or a grant uh, that you're working on. It could be a sort of a graduate student's PhD dissertation. It could be some, any sort of set of analyses that needs the same kind of compute equipment, maybe the same sorts of uh, data files, um, uh, same sort of workflows, some collection and same people. So some sort of abstraction that fits your, the way that you do research in your lab and share that with others. Um, it, it could even be like a, you could set aside a little project for some undergraduates, for example, where they can be segregated and do whatever they need to do to learn about the e-research that you're trying to train them without screwing up any of your main data. So, so key to this, of course, is that you can set a budget for what you want to do. And, you know, you can make that small at first while you're learning what things cost and then change that later. If I go to my lab settings here, um, I can see that uh, that is where I would do that. And in particular, I can manage my research group. So I can add users, I can add administrators, um, and uh, just people who can see things. I can set a timeline and a budget. And importantly, I can set the billing codes that can be integrated with the university billing system um, to reconcile which grants the expense for the AWS costs come from. So all of that is very handy thing to do. So going back to this project screen, Importantly, at all times, I see my progress towards the budget. 
um, and I get alerts and everyone on the project gets alerts at 25% of spend, uh, 50% of spend, 75% of spend, and 100% of spend. And this is really handy because, you know, if you start a GPU machine and you leave it running overnight accidentally because you've forgotten to use the smart schedule feature, um, you, you can you can get an alert and then you can literally go to your cell phone and fix that, turn that off. Um, and and I have actually done that. And so it's 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 really really nice to to be able to manage things this way. So I also get this overview of what everything I have, all the resources that I have running. So if I go to my machines, for example, I can see how i you can see how you can provision a lab dynamically as you go for the kinds of analyses that you would want to do. So here I have a, a bunch of machines and I'll just kind of go through the kinds of use cases that these might be good for. And, and they, I think they reflect a lot of researcher needs. Um, the first one, and these are drawn from neuroimaging. Um, so the first one is FreeSurfer. And for those who don't know, that is a, um, a commonly used neuroimaging application it calculates the thickness of the cortex at different locations and this is a very sensitive and important measurement for looking at change um, in the brain with development and with aging. Now that's all great but the thing is that this application takes about half a day to run on, on, a, on a single brain and we would always process hundreds or thousands of these at the same time. So you can see that this really quickly exceeds the, the needs of a particular of a laptop or a desktop. Um, now this is a perfect kind of job for a cluster as well. But I just show this here because one of the things that we noticed was that, you know, it's there's a big overhead in moving your job to a cluster. If you can just have a nice, powerful multi-core machine for the time that you need it. In this case, I've got a, a, a machine that has 72 vCPUs, so that can process 72 brains at once. So in a day, I can do twice that. And, and that's sometimes all that was really needed, simplifying the overhead of getting things done, just, just bang it out and um, turn it off when you're done. And, and then you don't have to worry about that time that it takes you to write a script, to figure out how to deal with a cluster. It's, it's just a lot of overhead. So a lot of people ended up using multi-core machines for a variety of things just simply because it was easier. So, so you have this flexibility to do that and save yourself time when you don't need a cluster. And if I wanted to edit this, I could simply go and choose an even larger machine. So I can go up to uh, 96 vCPUs here and choose that. And as long as I turn that off when I'm done, which I can even do with the smart scheduling depending on what's running, um, then I'm not paying for it when it's not running. Nathan uh, highlighted the RStudio use case where we need a big memory machine for some sort of analysis, like an, especially an R analysis. This came up very often, and this is an example of a kind of thing that you could have handy. I mentioned GPUs. We use them for computational purposes, but a lot of people are using GPUs for machine learning just to experiment with a particular type of analysis. And this is something that you can uh, spin up as you need it, do what you need, and then stop it. And, um, and a common use case for, for outfitting a lab with something that you wouldn't ordinarily keep. And then Nathan talked about the service catalog. So it's a lot of these types of research pipelines require a huge amount of software um, that has to be installed rather carefully so that things don't interfere with each other. And then you kind of want to keep it the same for all of your analyses. So this is an example of a service catalog offering that reflects, um, in fact, a workshop that I, I gave a few months ago um, with a lot of things on it that you could use for analysis in practice. And, and this is the kind of thing that the research IT could help scientists with or researchers might just do and then save. And I'll show you how you modify that kind of thing later. But all, all told, so these are just machines, but sometimes you need a cluster. And that's where I think um, Ronan really shines. And I'll show how this, how you can create an auto-scaling cluster. Um, so, so one thing about AWS clusters, and I saw a question go by earlier about um, how do you turn things off when jobs have started running. Clusters are amazing in that they're elastic. So they grow and they shrink to do the work that is required of them. So when you submit jobs using your favorite scheduler into a queue, what happens is it looks and sees how many jobs there are and spins up as many nodes as 
it needs up to a limit you've configured to run those jobs and it turns them off immediately after they've done. I saw another question go by about spot pricing. This is where you can really take advantage of spot pricing. Spot pricing gives you, for those who are unfamiliar with it, gives you a really steep discount on AWS instances so that you can get your work done for a lot less money, except the risk is that sometimes those spot instances might be reclaimed and then the job might terminate as that happens. So this is really perfect for researchers where, number one, you might have a workflow system such as Nextflow or Make, especially if you're in bioinformatics maybe, or other such systems where they can see what jobs have been um, completed uh, and pick up and do the ones that haven't been. Um, it's also good for sort of things that are not uh, the, the highest priority in the world so that if you do stumble and that things are, are stopped, you know, you can get by, you can get your abstract in. So let me just show you how you create a cluster. Um, there's two ways you can do this. Um, you can start from a package um, that has been pre-configured for you, um, which could be a cluster that you create and add software to and save, or you can do it from scratch. And I'll just show how you do this from scratch. So so here you choose your operating system and you choose your scheduler. Slurm is really popular in um, universities, but there are also a lot of packages that work, in fact, are written to work with different schedulers. So you have your choice, but I'll just choose a Slurm one here for illustration purposes. You give it a name and I'll just choose another brain part. and um, you get to choose your master node and your compute node. So your master node is where you log on and it's up all the time and it controls the compute node. So you can usually make that something very small and inexpensive so that the cluster doesn't cost much while it's running when there's no jobs to be done. Alternatively, you might choose to choose a more powerful master node if you want to sort of test things out on that computer and before you submit them. So you have your choice there. Here, I'll just uh, choose a, a compute node that's reasonable and something something that's good for computing. And this is the kind of thing that AWS Solution Architects can help you to pick when you know what kind of um, uh, application you want to run. You have storage that you can choose um, and you can change the size of that. I, I won't do that right now, but that would be for your working data. You select an SSH key. and um, you can choose a minimum and maximum compute node. So this tells you how large your cluster can ever get. So if you're worried about making sure that the cost of it is bounded, you know, you don't want to set this so huge that, that you could accidentally start a lot more jobs than you think you are and that things run um, out of control. But I can make this machine type as large as I want here, and then I can choose as many of those machines as I need to run my jobs. And then you can see how much cluster potential you have. What's the maximum number of vCPUs that you're going to have and what's the minimum? We have, this is a pass through basically um, with really nice uh, control over parallel cluster if people are familiar with AWS parallel cluster. So you also have access to the Intel HPC tools and hyper threading, which you can turn on and off. And if you're in certain uh, scientific domains where hyper threading is not very useful, you can just turn that off for performance reasons. You also have access to Elastic Fabric Adapter, which is our fast networking, so you can run tightly coupled uh, clusters this way with running weather simulations or physics codes and things of that nature. Um, spot pricing is, of course, I think a very useful thing for researchers um, to take advantage of to lower their costs and get more compute out. And I think that this is a very useful feature here in that you can see with spot pricing and with different types of uh, usage patterns, how much this cluster will cost you. Because otherwise, I think it can be a bit of a big mystery. So you can see here that this is with spot price, relentless use. Um, you're going full tilt compute. Um, this is going to cost you $250 per week. If you disable that, um, uh, you can see that um, the cost is a lot higher. And this may be appropriate if you have a deadline and you've got to get something done. But you have the choice.
So I won't start this cluster because I've already started one, um, and this is uh, Hippocampus, my cluster here, and I'll show you how you can access that. So hopefully it will pop up right on link here. So Nathan showed you how you could, and I've already connected to it, so it already has a card, um, uh, but, uh, and it's connecting. Okay, so we did our studio and connected with the Ronin Lake application that way, but you can also create a desktop. And this is really useful because you get a full out visualization desktop. It's you're in front of it's as if you're in front of your cluster on your laptop or your computer, but you've got the whole power of the cluster behind it. So that means that you can run your compute and then you can you know, check your results and, and go on from there and scale up, scale down as you need on your on the cluster master node and um, uh, and and work just as if you were had that resource locally. So it's uh, this is using DCV, which is a, uh, a protocol that is um, uh, available with all EC2 instances from AWS, and this is of course securely tunneled through port 22, as Nathan described. So it's not RDP or anything like that. This is its own protocol. Okay. Do not want to install updates. Okay, so so just pop up a terminal here, and um, uh, so you can visualize data um, here. For example, um, what I have, I, I just wanted to show you that um, I'll pull back here. The there is a lot of a lot of a lot of times there are data sets that are available to you on like if you're a biomedical researcher on NIH, um, and they're stored on S3 buckets in the cloud. But you you need to be able to access them. So there are sometimes uh, application processes that you need to go through to get access to them. But there's also open data that is stored on um, AWS, and so. Uh, this is just an example of a neuroimaging data set of, of the type that one might access. And here's the command uh, to access it using the command line interface. And this is just this is just highlighting where the um, uh, whoops. Sorry about that. Get back to my window. Whoops. This is just an example of how the how Ronin integrates with everything else that you have on AWS. So uh, I can look at the subject at the at the directory that's there with an AWS LS command, which is really very similar to a lot of the Unix commands, um, and see what is in there. And then I can also copy it and um, sync data back and forth. So this is how I would put data that I processed into long-term storage in object storage. Um, and this is also how I would access neuroimaging or genomics data sets that are available on S3. Um, there might be some slight differences depending on what software packages you have to use to access those, but the gist of it is that you can connect to all of that, copy it locally, work on it in a cluster, and then put things back. So I've, I've actually uh, copied one of the data sets just to show you um, um, this is a neuroimaging data set with a bunch of subjects, um, and there's structural and uh, functional data, but I'll just go to one of those and find the anatomical data set, and just look at it using one of my normal, uh, neuroimaging tools. So this is uh, FSL, this is a commonly used package. Um, this is a structural brain image. I'll just change the intensity slightly to make it a little bit nicer looking. But you can see that this is the kind of, this is the sort of thing that you would do in your domain to check the data after processing um, and then continue to your next steps. 
So often you want to uh, install software and you can do that in the normal way it's by downloading that and installing that just as you would um, on any computer. But on the cluster, there's also a tool, especially for those in the physical sciences who are used to this package manager called SPAC. And so um, this is uh, a, a tool that has been produced by the Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Um, and it's a package manager for supercomputers. Um, so if you're used to a supercomputer environment, you may be very familiar with SPAC. And, and this is particularly useful for those cases where you have to compile um, an application specifically for that hardware in order to eke out the best performance from that. So some, some types of applications don't care and others really do. And so that is, that is very useful. So just, um, just to finish up here uh, for the, so going back to, um, uh, going back to my cluster, I'll show you how you can save this. So if I were to make changes to this, for example, um, if I go back to the settings here, I could take this cluster where I've added new software and package it. I just need to give it a name. And then I will reboot it and create this package. Okay, and then if I go to the um, auto scale cluster, if I wanted to go back here and create a new project, for example, you could see that my new cluster is pending. This is just fabulous for reproducibility. If you put a lot of stuff on your cluster, you get your analysis done, you know, you know where your data lives, that's fine, but this contains the entire pipeline. And not only that, but you can deploy this then at scale. So you can call this, you know, hippocampus paper number one or whatever that analysis was and go back to that and, and reanalyze everything if you needed to, which is a huge time saving thing rather than spending about a week finding all of the pieces that you need and delaying, um, which is kind of more of the thing that I did. <laughs> anyway, um, this is, uh, this is this, I think the last thing that I just want to show you, I have here a cluster that has been stopped. This is one of the cheapest ways to store a cluster because when it is not running and you don't need the compute, then you're just paying for the drives. So you can see here that the total cost of this is $14 a month. And this means that that cluster is ready to go at any time for my analysis. So um, everything is configured and just waiting for me. Um, and so this is a huge uh, feature of of, uh, of Ronin. So with that, I will um, uh, I'll put up this thank you slide and uh, leave it open. Turn it back to everyone for questions. Fantastic. Thank you, Nathan and Tara. What a wonderful presentation. So we do have quite a few questions coming through. I think Don's been doing his best, but we do have a very inquisitive audience. So I'm just going to start down the line. And I think we already touched on this topic, but maybe you could elaborate. Is Ronin NIST 800-171 or CMMC compliant? Uh, yeah, so it can be deployed. To, uh, I, I touched on a little bit, I, I saw that question go by as I was, I was presenting. So because we're deployed inside your, uh, your AWS account, if you can configure an AWS account to be compliant and audited and certified, Ronin lives within that, inside a subnet, inside a VPC, and it orchestrates things within your account. You can actually lock it down so that nothing ever leaves if you need to, uh, that it's uh, really tightly accessed only through VPN it's completely up to you. So if it's possible to configure it on AWS, it, uh, Ronan will be able to inherit uh, that, that configuration of security. Wonderful. Okay, next question. Can Ronan be used in AWS GovCloud? Uh, it hasn't been yet, but ag again, because we deploy the way we do, uh, because we've stuck to AWS's greatest hits when it comes to services, things like S3, uh, EC2, EBS, uh, Parallel Cluster is even uh, deployed inside GovCloud, I know, as well. So uh, it hasn't been yet, but we're more than happy to work with you. We've done very secure environments. I know that GovCloud is a little bit restricted in 
uh, a couple of ways, but we'd be more than happy to work with you to, to get that done. Great. This one's a long one. It sounds like your build, your build the system in your AWS infrastructure environment, data transfer is typically involved in research projects. If our institution uses an AWS Direct Connect, is it possible for us to utilize it when using Ronin or are we limited to commodity internet? Uh, no, so uh, again, I, everything that you can configure or expose to AWS, we are compatible with. So uh, direct connects, uh, VPN peering, uh, storage gateways, uh, any other way you would like to set up and configure your on-prem to talk to your AWS account, we're compatible with. And we can walk you through, uh, like our team can help you configure bespoke bits and pieces as well. And we often do this uh, when we get started for things like license servers, being able to, uh, you know, if you've got, 70 licensed servers at your university that are on premise, we'll actually help you map them to expose them to the Ronin environment. There are things like that. So it's it, we do that all the time. Great. How do I share my data in an S3 bucket with my colleague? Uh, in a really easy way. There's a couple oh, there's a couple of different ways. So uh, if you're an administrator of a project, you can actually add a colleague to your project. So you can give them a level of permission that you're, you want to share your project with. Now on our S3 tools, we didn't touch on them today, but we actually have a secure way for you to build a bucket in a handful of keystrokes, build it with a secure bucket policy. And then when you need to, uh, there's a single button on there to generate a key for your bucket that you could share with a colleague. Ronan does 11 steps for you in two different products to create the policy and the sharing key for specifically that bucket. And we also have buttons there as well to rotate your keys and to delete your keys. So uh, if you're managing a sensitive data set, we've got loads of single click buttons or very short workflows to make sure that you can secure or keep control of that environment, make sure that you're, you're rotating your keys off and all that type of stuff. Okay, and I'm gonna end on this one. And if your question didn't get answered, we will make sure to follow up with you. We have cataloged these, um, but I think this one is very timely. Is Ronin fully Australian based? Is there a US presence, um, based presence, both for support and for billing? Yeah, so Ronin is a global company. We already have customers all over, all over the world, uh, UK, Europe, uh, uh, the US, Asia, Australia, where we're obviously from my accent, you can tell we were, we began. Uh, and we have support in all of those countries as well. So we can we can talk about that. If uh, Depending on what level of support you need, we actually built Ronan with a consulting company in the background. So uh, we self-funded the Ronan company with a consulting company that can help sell support or help uh, with support wherever you are. Fantastic. I want to thank you both again for such a great presentation today. And for our audience, um, you can find information about upcoming sessions as well as recordings and presentation decks on um, past presentations on our series homepage or the AWS Education Research Seminar Series homepage. I put the link in the chat. If you have questions about press presentations or ideas for future presentations, please email us at that alias that um, is on the screen. Uh, AWS WWPS seminar at amazon.com. And please save the day for our next AWS Research IT training series session on AWS networking for research IT. That will be with Varun Pohl, Senior Solutions Architect at AWS, and will be held on November 19th from 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock a.m. Pacific Standard Time. You will receive an email with the registration link once that's available if you registered for this session or any past presentation that we've had through the series. Thank you all so much for joining us and we hope to see you again soon. Great. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye.